they were just, uh, you know, tweeting out mean things about it. But some, some people have thought about it. And I think many of them are on this call today. Um, and it reminded me actually of, of a different moment where, where you and I were together 10, 12 years ago uh, when you uh, gave a speech at the J Street Conference. And I actually went, went back and found the this, this speech. Um, I, I think you probably know which one I'm talking about. Maybe we'll see. Um, in it, you were talking about um, the sort of history of the American Jewish community as it relates to supporting two states. You talked about uh, Breva in 1979 as the first American Jewish organization to publicly call for two states. And then, you know, as you move forward in history, the creation of, of, of APN in 81, uh, IPF in nine, you know, 93, I think it was, and J Street ultimately. And I'm, I'm gonna read this now, because it was a good line. He said something about, you know, we come together knowing that we are not the first group of Jews to gather in defense of the principles in Israel's Declaration of Independence, but make no mistake, we are the last. And your point in that, which was, by the way, a very powerful moment, right, was that it was a moment of truth for Israel and for the American Jewish community as to whether there is going to be this two-state solution that um, maintains the Jewish and democratic nature of the state of Israel or not. And I think, you know, if you, where you went on in the speech was saying, you know, if we don't achieve this now or in the near future, then future generations will be mourning the loss of either the Jewish nature of the state or the democratic nature of the state, um, you know, that, that stands for the, the principles in the Declaration of Independence. So I was thinking about that as I was again reading, reading your piece in Jewish Currents and, you know, just thinking about what that, again, it's been 10, 12 years, so it's been a minute, but what, what that process, what that evolution has been like for you to get to the point where you now put out this new vision and this new idea um, and I promise I'm going to turn it over to you in a second because people want to hear from you and not me. But the one thing I do want to add is that, you know, I really, first of all, I, I appreciate you joining us and being with us and taking the time. And I uh, appreciate all the people who are with us on Zoom or wa watching on YouTube. There are a lot of people who uh, have shared sentiments with me this week and with Ori and with others that they didn't know why we were having you on and why would an organization that supports a two-state solution bring on somebody who's got you know, a, a divergent view and then different ideas. And I think that's, a, for me, a, a really easy answer. Um, we, you and I, and also the big we of everyone involved in this, support peace and support equality and support justice and are part of building and nurturing and maintaining a movement toward that end. And I think you've now um, articulated a different end, end goal. Um, but for me, it's really important for us to be able to say, we are all together in conversation. And even if we really, really disagree that we can do that. And you know, there's a lot of discussion in the broader Jewish community about civil discourse and can we, can we all be at the table together? Um, and it's usually more a, a left-right divide there. Um, but I'm seeing it this week too with people who ha have now decided they don't necessarily want you at their table. Um, and so I am very happy to have you at our table to discuss what we agree about and what we disagree about. So please, Peter. Um, well, thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm a, I'm a great admirer, uh, have been for a long time, remain uh, I'm a great admirer of APN. Some of my favorite people um, are, uh, are connected to to, to APN, um, uh, folks, some folks on your board who I'm, I really admire, and you yourself. Um, and, and yeah, I think that, um, you know, one of my favorite Jewish texts is, you know, is the line in, in Perkei Avot, you know, who is wise, the one who learns from all people. Um, and um, if that, the message is that if you want to be wise, you should seek out opinions that are different from yours. Um, and, and that's why, you know, to those people who are on this call, who vehemently disagree with me, um, you are the wisest in some ways in this call in the sense that you are the people who are stretching yourself the most to listen to those who disagree with them. And I think that's something that in the United States in general and in the Jewish community on both the progressive and the more conservative sides, people do much too little of. And I personally, you know, um, have never wanted, um, nor do I, to live in a Jewish community that is defined by people who share my politics. I don't, you know, if you look at the places that, um, you know, where I spend my Jewish life, they're not left-wing spaces. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and partly it's because, you know, I like them for other reasons, but it's partly because I don't wanna just be surrounded by people who, who agree with me. Um, in terms of my own evolution, um, 
I, I'm not the kind of person who tends to have epiphanies. Things tend to come to me slowly over time. Um, shifts kind of happen slowly. Um, I often am, find myself at war with myself, different parts of my heart and brain arguing with one another. Sometimes I feel like I almost personify them as different members of my, you know, pe different people I know who I feel like are from my family, or, you know, reside in different parts of my brain speaking to one another. Um, and um, that conversation has become, I would say, more intense over time um, because uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't come from a family of deracinated universalist people. Some people influence me the most in my family are pretty fiercely tribal. Um, and I have a lot of that in myself. Um, I'm not a universalist. I mean, I, I believe that while it's true that the Torah begins with universal human beings, right? Adam and Eve and Noah are not Jews. And so there's obviously a, a clear, profound importance to the idea that all people are created in the image of God. I also believe that Jews are an extended family and we are allowed to have obligations to our extended family, which um, are greater, but that doesn't, but there are also, but that doesn't mean a give us a blank, that doesn't give us a blank check. Um, anyway, so these are some of the struggles that I've had. And sometimes I feel like I, with this piece crossed a Rubicon um, and yet there are, parts of my heart and brain that are still on the other side of that room, you know, um, uh, depending on what time of day you catch me. But um, what I felt like I could not ignore was that although it is impossible to claim that the two-state solution, you can't say the two-state solution is impossible because you can't say that any historical eventuality, potential event, that any, any potential historical event is impossible, right? I mean, Kanye West could be president. The Austro-Hungarian Empire could be revived, right? Anything is possible, right? But it's a question of probabilities. Um, and I think it seems to me, in, uh, it became undisputable to me that the possibility of a Palestinian state as I define it, uh, by which I mean a viable and sovereign Palestinian state, one that can meet certain kind of bare minimums for basic rights for Palestinians has become much less likely and that I think, and this is part of what's part of my argument, it has become, as it has become less likely and as Palestinian statehood has been defined down again and again and again to mean less sovereignty and less territory, it has become a much less compelling vision. And as it has become a less compelling vision, it has stopped being a vision that can produce the kind of movement that would be necessary to make change. Um, and that's why I ultimately went from believing, which I had for many years, that equality, whether in one equal state or a confederation, was less realistic to believing that in a funny way it might be more realistic because it is a moral vision which is compelling enough to produce the kind of mass movement that could, that could, that could balance against Israel's overwhelming military and geopolitical power. Hour. Um, and so that's part of the, the kind of my thinking in this evolution. Thank you. You know, one of the questions that, again, I, I've been asking myself, but also have seen, seen out there in plenty of comments, both, I would say, the, the supportive and the less supportive, and, and you started to get to it here, is sort of the differentiation between your, your essay as a, you know, an intellectual or, or perhaps moral vision versus as a political program. Mm -hmm. And that question, and we had uh, Khalil Shikaki with, on with us a few weeks ago, and he was talking about some of the polling among Palestinians about what's preferred now, right? Well, one state vision, a two state vision. And I asked him whether there was polling that distinguished between what do people prefer if we had you know, a magic wand, I could snap my fingers and make it happen versus what do people think is viable? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the questions that we got in came back to that sort of theme of like, oh yeah, well, Peter, you say this, but how could that possibly happen? Because depending which you know, historical moment people would like to focus on anything from the very real, very current challenges back to you know, thousands of years of Jewish history where people wanna pull out their examples and say, this, didn't, this isn't possible. So what I'm curious about is whether as you were writing this, do, you know, are you thinking about this as really a, a political program that this is what you now want to advocate for and you think other, other groups, other people should be advocating for? Or is it more of a vision statement of saying that, you know, this is what a compelling future could look like? And they're obviously not mutually exclusive, but. Right, I mean, 
it, it's it's not um, th my piece is not a blueprint for all the particulars of how um, one state or a confederation would work. I think that would be among other things a pretty boring piece to read. Um, and there's a lot of there are a lot of people who've actually whose work I cite who've done tried to do some of that. Nor am I capable of sketching out how we would move from point A to point B. I do try to suggest in the piece a few things that I think could be significant uh, vehicles for change. I talk again, again, Palestinians in East Jerusalem voting, um, uh, um, the end of the Palestinian Authority. Um, uh, I obviously think that one of the things I didn't, maybe not have said explicitly, but that I would really love to see would be for um, some kind of merger between um, uh, merits and the joint list. Um, and, so, uh, and so you could have a kind of a, a more powerful and kind of genuinely kind of Jewish Palestinian left in Israel. Um, but, um, but I think, uh, but that is, those are just some, some thoughts about some, some moves that could, I've also written about conditioning military aid in the past, um, but that's not, um, it, I think though, when one says things like these, this is, un, this is too unrealistic, I think it's important to just remind ourselves of a couple of things, which is to say that moral, great moral progress, fundamental change, often almost always looks unrealistic at a certain point, right? Um, and so it's often a question of when one, um, the, the, what, what, what great mass movements with great moral visions do is they make the impossible become possible. I mean, in some ways we are seeing that with our very, in front of our eyes with Black Lives Matter. I mean, who thought there would be a conversation about about radically redistributing resources away from the police, right? You know, if you had asked someone that, you know, people would have said, well, that's completely utopian. And it's actually now become thinkable. Um, I think the other thing is, I see a lot of people in responding to me as saying, neither Jews nor Palestinians want this, right? Neither Israeli Jews nor Palestinians want this. And I think that there's a problem with that move because Israeli Jews and Palestinians Palestinians are not similarly situated vis-a-vis -vis this, right? It is certainly true that Israeli Jews and probably diaspora Jews overwhelmingly don't want this. And I would argue that overwhelmingly Israeli Jews and I would say American Jewish leadership organizations have shown that what they prefer is the status quo, right? Um, I would challenge, I think there are people who genuinely support two states but a great many of the people in this conversation who ostensibly to support two states have been willing participants in the death of two states because they've not been actually willing to challenge the Israeli government in order to make the two state solution, um, give it a chance of actually succeeding. They've acquiesced in endless settlement growth, for instance. APN is of course not one of those. But the other thing is for Palestinians, it's different. In terms of Palestinian polling, um, uh, you, we, we now have one state and two states being relatively close in polling in the, the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, right? After two states for a long period of time being much more popular. I think it's worth saying a couple of those things about that. First of all, most Palestinians don't live in the West Bank, East Jerusalem or Gaza, right? I think if you look at the total population of Palestinians including the diaspora, it's maybe a third or 40%. So we don't really know what the Palestinian population as a whole believes, because I haven't seen polling of the Palestinian diaspora. So it's important to think about that when we, and it's quite likely that Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza would be the most pro two states, right? Whereas Palestinian refugees would be the most interested in refugee return, which is difficult to combine, to, 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 to merge with two states as it's often conceived, one. Secondly, Palestinians have been presented for decades now with the notion that the acceptable position in the eyes of the international community and it's including its most powerful elements like the United States is two states, right? That's essentially been what's put on the table as the international legitimate position. To the degree that changes, I think that also has an impact on Palestinian opinion. And we also have a Palestinian leadership and fairly illegitimate Palestinian leadership that, su that supports two states. So I think that it is um, Palestinian views vis-a-vis -vis one versus two states, I think are quite different than Israeli Jewish views. And it's much less clear to me that there is anything like a Palestinian consensus in favor of two states rather than one state. Whereas yes, there, what I think there is a consensus for among Israeli Jews and many diaspora Jews is the status quo, which is one state in which millions of Palestinians lack basic rights. 
Well, you know, to your point about the different views and perspectives between the Israelis and Palestinians, it's obviously it's based in the in the in the power differentiation yeah. right now. That in either a two-state model or in in a, a one-state or confederation model, ultimately we're talking about an Israeli Jewish community giving up po some power and privilege that they currently have. Yes, and I think you know I'm sure all of us have seen um, you know the sort of occasional right-wing voices that have been out there speaking up in opposition to annexation now. And people on the left tend to love to sh share those around and say, look, look, you know, the right. But really most of those voices have, have just been saying, we like the status quo. Absolutely. Yeah, the occupation has been good for us. Why are you messing with this? Right, right. And so, you know, one of the things I was thinking about about your piece is whether you are intentional in the fact that this could also be a wake up moment for some of those people who, as you said, I think have ostensibly supported two states, but not taken any action or have been complicit in just continued occupation. Because again, we're not here to dig into annexation in particular, but I think you know, perspective and APN's view around the annexation debate has been, you know, yes, it's essential that we oppose annexation and we marshal all the forces in opposition to annexation, but that we shouldn't call that a win. Right, that's just BB moving the, the goalposts there, that we need to make sure that we're focusing on the fact that annexation is the symptom of the disease of occupation. And so I wonder whether, you know, whether you did it A, intentionally, or whether you think that it's true that this might be a wake up call for some of those sort of passive two state solution supporters to say, oh, look, you know, the discourse in our community is changing. And if we are committed to two states, we may need to act differently about that wasn't the purpose of why I wrote it. Um, if that is a byproduct, I would be pleased about that. I, what I've noticed in the response, I mean, it's in a way is it's ironic because I'm, I'm, I'm saying I no longer have faith in the two state solution. What I find is that my most vociferous critics are people who themselves didn't really support the two state solution, right? That the more, the, the, the people who most passionately actually genuinely believed in the two state solution and were willing to fight for it, and willing to challenge the Israeli government and willing to consider things like conditioning aid and willing to consider efforts at the UN and a whole series of things are actually, I find, the ones who are most open to having a respectful dialogue about this, like you, like you, like you folks, right? Um, so I think that there's been a certain, I would say, um, um, well, I, I, I just, I, I think it's, 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 it's noteworthy. It, it reminds me of all the people back in 2000 who said, you know, um, uh, Yasser Arafat can never be forgiven for rejecting Ehud Barak's offer. And I would say, well, would you have accepted Ehud Barak's offer? And they say, never, right? <laughs> you know, um, so anyway, um, I, I, uh, I, I would like to see that, that play itself out. I, I do think though it's important, I think you were getting at this, to remember that um, Israel controls the West Bank, whether it annexes or not. Right, uh, control is uh, the, is the reality. Um, annexation would have some practical impact, um, and it has a clearly kind of has a psychological impact. Um, but that the the the, the I think that essentially I think de facto annexation took took place in many ways years ago, and so that it's important to remember that. That's not that's not that's not a reason to say you know, we, we're happy about annexation, but I think it's just important to remember, as you say, not to allow us to move the goalposts. I mean, when sometimes people say, well, if Israel annexes, then the West Bank, then it becomes apartheid in the West Bank. I think, well, well why does it annexation that makes it apartheid? What makes it, if, if it's apartheid, it's because you have people, two different ethno-religious communities living under different law, right? That's what would make it apartheid, not the fact that this now becomes jure rather than de facto. It's been de facto, after all, for most of Israel's history, right? Israel was created in 1948, and it's, this has been the case since 1967. Yeah, there is, by the way, along those lines, a new report out from uh, Michal Svad and, and yeah. Yashdin yeah. that makes a, a very, um, you know, a very specific legal argument using the international definition of the crime of apartheid mm -hmm. that current occupation, not looking forward to annexation, yeah does in fact meet that bar. And, and again, it's not, a, it's not a linguistics question. It isn't, you know, is it nice or do we like to call it apartheid or not? It's a legal argument stating that it is apartheid. Um, right. So that's an interesting note. So it, we've been talking about the politics for a second. I wanna back up to sort of your own, your, your thoughts and your feelings. Mm. Um, I'm sure this is not the first time for you, but mm. a lot of people have responded to this by saying, Peter is not a Zionist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is, 
anti-Zionist, post-Zionist, you know, blah, 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 Zionist, whatever you want to call it, that this vision, which would be, again, to sort of, you know, paraphrase them, you know, the end of a Jewish state right. means right. that you are not a Zionist. Right. So how do you, how do you answer that? What do you, I mean, obviously your, your piece argues that this is a Zionist vision, so. Yes, that's right. So this has to do with how one defines the term Zionist, right? And I think that for many, many people now, many people, Zionist equals um, Jewish state, um, a state that favors Jews over Palestinians and everybody else. Um, part of what I try to do and argue in my piece, and I would recommend folks to, you know, to read Dmitry Sumsi's book, Beyond the Nation State, is to, is to challenge that. Um, um, for me, Zionism is a vision which is in opposition to what I might call diasporaism, right? It the, the, what it means to be a Zionist is, is to believe in the preciousness of a Jewish society, a Jewish home in the land of Israel, because, the, because uh, they can radiate throughout the Jewish world because there are things that are possible in a Jewish society in the land of Israel that are not possible in diaspora. That I don't take the view that some Zion Zionists might, that Jewish life is empty in the diaspora, right? I mean, I'm not that Machmir a Zionist, right? You could say, but um, but I, I I do believe that um, if you look whether it's the recreation of Hebrew as a living language, whether it's certain mitzvot that can only be performed in the land of Israel, whether it's a society that's rich enough to have public debates within a Jewish discourse in the way that you would not have in the United States or in. Britain or Canada, um, that those are all precious things. And, and for me, in that sense, I think of my, I think, I, you know, influenced by, you know, the trajectory that starts with, uh, you know, Achad Ha'am, who, who, who much more than Herzl really was interested in the notion of a Jewish society as a kind of cultural center for Jews around the world. Herzl, Herzl basically just thought that this Jewish state was going to be basically like Vienna. You know, he didn't have nearly, I think, as rich a sense of what that cultural production would look like, given his own background. So that is what makes me a Zionist. Um, now, I recognize that my definition of Zionism will be, might be uh, unorthodox to many people. Um, but for me, it's, um, it's important to me because it means that the notion of, of a Jewish society, a Jewish home um, that can, uh, is, 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 um, ha is something that I believe in very deeply. Now, obviously people will say, well, you're, you're kidding yourself, Beinart, without the hard shell of a Jewish state, all of this, this Jewish society cannot survive. And, and, and I spend a lot of time in my piece trying to argue exactly against that proposition. Right, so, I mean, that leads right into the next question. I think there are people, you know, there are definitely people out there who say, okay, well, I, I you know, again, if we had magic wand and we could make that happen, I might accept that view, but they don't accept the, the political reality. And, and that gets into the, some of the questions, you know, there's been a characterization of basically saying, okay, Peter now supports one state. Mm -hmm. but your piece is actually a little more, more nuanced than that, right? There's, you know, there's kind of one state, there's a confederation model. It looks like you're actually leaning toward that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about that distinction and, and why you think that is, um, the, the, the better goal, the better ideal, both in terms of, again, as an exercise of what you would like a Jewish and an Israeli future to look like, but also in, in terms of, you know, do you think that there's, there's more sort of political viability in that model? You mean in the model of, of one state or a confederation? Yeah. Like right. those distinctions, again, I'm, you know, for yeah. me, I come back to both of these of like, what do we think is a good idea? And then the politics of what do we think is viable? Right. So, as I said earlier, to me, um, um, the the only way that I think the status quo is changed for the better is through a, a, a mass movement on the ground and around the world that has a moral vision. Um, I fear very much that without that, um, we will that the status quo will degenerate into something much worse even than apartheid, um, which is that you will have um, um, round after round of cycles of intifadas, violent conflict, which I think will bring the possibility of mass expulsion, which after all is in Israel's DNA, political DNA, 
right? I mean, one of the things that we have learned painfully in the United States in the Trump era is that things that are in our country's political DNA um, don't always remain in the past. Um, that they that they can be they can be resuscitated um, uh, under under adverse circumstances in, in very frightening ways, um, and I I really do worry about that prospect, um, and and so for me the, the the value of equality is that I think it is a vision that is powerful enough to produce change. Um, what the ultimate end state is. I don't know. One of the things that I tried to talk about in the piece is that, is, that Israel Palestine is a binational state um, today, uh, which is to say it's not a country, it's not a, it's not a country that has an overarching, you know, overarching uh, political uh, kind of national identity. You know, even in very divided societies like the United States, people would basically mostly see themselves as Americans. Um, uh, in South Africa, profoundly divided. And yet there was an overarching notion of South Africanness among both black and white South Africans. That's not the case in Israel Palestine today. And that's why it seems to me when one thinks about what, a what, a, what kind of equality might look like at the level of constitutional and political systems, there has to be a recognition of that, which means a recognition of the need for these two different peoples, these two different nations to have a high degree of autonomy and also to be able to protect their communal rights against a potential tyranny of the majority. And that's one of the reasons that I talk you know, about, about some of the, the models in Belgium and in Northern Ireland, which, in, which, in which communities can block things from happening, even if there's a majority support for them, if, they, if, if overwhelmingly one community sees them as being adverse. And so it seems to me then one is talking about a kind of a spectrum. There, there's a kind of a spectrum between federation in which you have one state that, that di allows different geographic and different communal groups to have a high degree of autonomy, right? So in, if you, in one state, I would imagine that you had some overarching entity that was in charge of Jew Hebrew language education, for instance, which would not just be geographic, but it would be, it would cover everybody who wanted a Hebrew language education, even if they were, the majority of their neighbors wanted an Arabic language education. For instance. That's something that Belgium does. So that, and then as you go along the spectrum towards more and more communal autonomy, you cross some invisible line from federation into confederation, right? Confederation being there actually are two states, but they have surrendered some significant amount of their powers to one overarching identity. Again, we can think a little bit about how the European Union functions in this regard, right? Whereas these states have, have surrendered some of their sovereignty to this overarching EU. And that's why, for instance, you have some degree of free movement, which is one of the things that a land for all, for instance, which promotes a confederation model talks about. And I think would be really important is kind of free movement within this, within this enterprise. So those are some of the range. And again, I would encourage people who really want to delve into this, there are some links in my piece and you can go to kind of people who really looked into this in even greater detail. So given that you just said you can follow those links, I'm gonna ask you a follow up on this anyway, <laughs> which is, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions that are variants of like, okay, yeah, sure, Belgium or maybe Northern Ireland, but what about Yugoslavia, you know, Bos you know Sudan, um, Lebanon, Iraq, all, all sorts of other places. What is, and I think it basically comes back down to the, you know, what makes this viable right. question. Right. Um, yeah, no, take it from there. Right, what do you think, what do, what do you think is the reality that, or, or the steps even, because maybe we're not into that reality, right. obviously. Right. So look, every historical country situation is different. I mean, I do think that talking about these comparative examples is really valuable. I'd encourage people who want to delve more into that into reading some of the writing of Oren Yiftachal, who's written about this, um, Limor Yehuda, who I quote in my piece as a dissertation, is all about these different models, people, uh, and how things have played out differently. On Yugoslavia, I, I just would note that the problem in Yugoslavia wasn't that you had an equal political system that fell apart, right, in, a, in this brutal way. The problem in Yugoslavia was that you had authoritarian, racist Serb domination, which produced, therefore, an effort at secession in a place where populations were deeply intermingled, 
which produced a kind of ethnic cleansing and, and, and war, right? So it seems to me Yugoslavia is, is, a, is a more of a warning for people who want to perpetuate the status, the, the oppressive status quo. Uh, in which you have a binational state in which one population is 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 denied basic rights than the alternative. You, in fact, you could look at Bosnia, which you know actually today, current day Bosnia, which is composed of Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats, actually as another example. I didn't have time to get into a piece. Another example of how consociationalism works. It's far from perfect, but actually they have Bosnia has been, been able to be a consociational model that has that has prevented a return to war. Um, I think that um, when one talks about Lebanon, um, uh, and I did some reading, I'm very interested in Lebanon and writing in reading this piece, and I, I, I think that there are a couple of important things to think about in terms of why Lebanon's particular situation where you, know, where you had a power divided between Shia, Sunni, and, and, and Maronite Christians collapsed. One of which is just that Israel has and uh, it's quite significant advantages over Lebanon in terms of its ability, I think, to make a liberal democracy work and be stable. First of all, again, as I say, its per capita income is three times Lebanon. Its literacy rate is considerably higher. Um, uh, it, it has the infrastructure um, that, that Israel has already created, which is a fairly effectively functioning liberal democracy for Jews, right? And one of the things we learned in the South Africa case is that that was quite an advantage for post-apartheid South Africa, because there were institutions that were functioning well with some accountability for one part of the population. They just needed to be expanded and built and broadened to the rest of the population. So those are, and, and the other advantage, the, the other thing that's really important to remember about the Lebanon case was that part of what happened in Lebanon was it was a weak state that was preyed upon by its neighbors, right? Um, one of those neighbors was Syria. Another of those neighbors was Israel, right? I don't need to remind you that Israel invaded Lebanon, right? So I think- um, I've, I've, I've spent some time there myself. Yes, yes, again, you of all people. So I think one other important difference between Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon is that it's hard to imagine there that it, Israel, Palestine being uh, being invaded by its neighbors, who, who would be you know much more powerful neighbors. Just the Israel, Palestine would be a powerful place, and I think therefore unlikely to be as damaged from external forces as Lebanon was. So those I didn't have a chance to get into the piece. The piece would have been was already too long as it is. But those are some of my thoughts about Yugoslavia and Lebanon. Gotcha. Thank you. So you know. Again, like I said, I've, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this and re reading people's responses this week. Um, admittedly, for me, most of those responses, not all, but most of them have been from Jewish voices mm -hmm. and, and Jewish Israeli voices. Yeah. Um, I have seen a lot of comments um, from, from Palestinians mostly saying, yeah, we've been saying this for a long time. Um, some of them, not all, but I'm curious um, what kind of responses you've gotten or what you know, kind of conversations, et cetera, you've had with, with Palestinians um, about this piece and about this vision. Right, well, maybe this is a good time to plug the fact that on Monday I'm doing a webinar uh, with you, my friend Yusuf Manayar, uh, yes. who's an American, um, uh, on, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that even more. Um, with FMAP, yes. Sorry? With FMAP. Yes, yes, Foundation for Middle East Peace and Jewish Currents is, is, is co-sponsoring it. Um, I, I um, Yes, I think that um, a lot of the Palestinian writing has been of the vein that you were suggesting, which is to say, um, we wanna talk about the privilege that allows Peter Beinart to write this and get all this attention when we have been writing versions of these things, not obviously exactly the same piece because mine was really written from a Jewish perspective and to a Jewish audience more than most Palestinian writing, but essentially, you know, and I think again, that's a very, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter, I think th those conversations about privilege have been brought to the surface and are really, really important to have. And it's part of my obligation um, as someone who does have uh, that privilege to try to use it in a way that lifts up Palestinian voices. And, and I, I have myself been very deeply affected by reading Palestinian writing. It's not just been an intellectual experience for me. It's been a, an emotional and almost a spiritual experience, I would even say, to have spent a lot of this quarantine really immersed in Palestinian voices. I mean, there was like day after day, I would like finish Daf Yomi, I'd finish my like page of Talmud, and I would go to read Palestinian writing. And I felt in some ways like 
I felt like uh, um, it was a kind of a spiritual experience to try to be seeing the world through Palestinian eyes um, more than I, I had been. And um, I think I would really, really encourage um, other Jews who have not done that to do that. Um, not to say it, one, it, 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 it means that one doesn't have the right to one's own opinion, um, but I think it's a powerful experience. And um, I think that we need to think about, regardless of whether you agree with with me or not on this point. I, I really think that we need to move towards a place in the American Jewish community in which it simply becomes unacceptable to continue to have conversations about Palestinians that are not also with Palestinians, to speak about Palestinians without them in the room all the time. Time, you know, um, and I, I just I think there is a dehumanization in that, even though I think it's often unconscious, even though I don't think, think people think about themselves as being dehumanizing. I think the consequence is dehumanizing. And so that's something that I really would hope that we would see as a as a, as a shift. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think um, I've, I've heard Amiya alone, the, the former head of the Shimbet, multiple times say to people, and this is a stark statement, so I'm just flagging, like, I've killed more Palestinians than you've ever met. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, I mean, it's scary. And, and again, he doesn't say it as some sort of like macho thing. He literally, you know, I've, I've heard him say it to people when he's arguing with them and they're, and they're telling him how, you know, he doesn't understand the Palestinian mindset or whatever that may be. And it goes to that conversation. Again, it's a very stark way of him mm -hmm. saying that, but of like, the importance of being in conversation and community and having Palestinian voices be part of our discussions. Right. Um, and again, you know, his, his statement is one that's, that's stuck with me um, because also because of the response that it gets from people, right? Because he's talking to people who normally wouldn't do that. Um, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times the moment we're in in America, Black Lives Matter movement, Trump administration, um, annexation we've talked about. One of the questions that I actually di didn't ask you at the beginning is, you know, wh why now? And are, are any of those or all of those people, those uh, influence your, you're deciding to write this now, you're coming to this moment, um, you know, how did you get to this? I think partly, um, I just felt that the arguments that I had been making for the two state solution for why it was still, why it was still a realistic goal, and um, and why it would meet the basic kind of needs of both populations, I felt they were becoming stale and disingenuous as I was saying them, you know, and I felt a sense that I I didn't initially feel like I had an alternative at all. Um, I just had a sense that I wasn't convincing myself. You know, you ever have that experience? You're like in a conversation with someone and you're saying things and like, I don't, you think, I don't think this is gonna be convincing to them because it's not convincing to me. Um, and I started to, to feel that in my, and, and, I, and as a writer in particular, that's a problem, right? I mean, like, you know, when you write, you, you have to write things that you feel like are convincing. And I, and I felt like, um, you know, this was a line that I had in the piece, early version, I took it out, but I also am very conscious of you know, as we all are, as you know, I know you're a parent, you know, you think about what model you're presenting for your kids. Mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about my, to my kids about the importance of being respectful and diplomatic when you're around people who disagree with you, because my kids have had some experience on this front um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to this subject. Um, but I also, um, I also want them to believe that you shouldn't silence and suppress your conscience. You know, um, and so I felt like I was hearing my a part of myself say back to me, "This isn't working for anymore." You know, um, and it, it led me to say, "I have to go. I have to go on a kind of. I have to make a project of trying to go back to think about if there are alternatives that 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 make sense to me or make more sense to me, because no alternative." is foolproof by any means. Any, any risk course that one takes is full of risks, but is there some, something that might be more convincing to me? And that was what led me to, you know, in a weird way, I had probably a little bit more time than I have, than I might have otherwise um, during this period. And so I just had the chance to read a lot and also talk to a lot of people who had 
knowledge of things that I was able to delve into in a way that I hadn't before. And that ultimately this piece is what came out of it. You know, some people during the quarantine learned how to, you know, I don't know, cook Egg bread. You know something. I called for the end of the Jewish state. I'm sure that many people can think of, uh, can think of better hobbies to take up, but this is, this is where I landed. So I, I don't actually know for sure, but I, I'm willing to bet we've got some press, uh, on this Zoom with us today, and you just gave them their their line right there, I think. But, um, you know, so P Peter, one of the questions I have, and I guess particularly li listening to this conversation, you know, where if, if I'm getting this right, what you're saying is you've come to this conclusion basically because you didn't think the arguments that you, among others, were making about a two-state solution and its viability were really compelling anymore, and we're going to move people to take action in that direction. And I know I'm, I'm a broken record on this on sort of the difference between desirability and viability. You know, if you had that magic wand mm -hmm. and you could snap your fingers and say, okay, we've got a one state federation, confederation, whatever version you'd like that, or we've got, you know, the two states that you were arguing for before last mm -hmm. week or that you were arguing for 10 years ago, right? If we said, you know, green line, whatever, mm -hmm. don't worry about that, you know, like a viable, you know, significant Palestinian sovereign state. What do you do? So I think a lot of that question has to do with how one, what exactly ima one imagines the, the, the contours of these and, and the, the outcome of this two-state arrangement is, you know? Um, and that's also where I think it starts to potentially bleed in a little bit to confederation. So I guess, I, 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 I think the best way for me to answer that would be to say, I don't think um, uh, at this point um, that um, a solution, a two-state solution that does not allow for Palestinians to have the right of refugee return um, is likely to ultimately be a morally acceptable or- Re ultimately Refugee return to where? Well, I think ultimately, a re I think the, the right of a refugee return not just to the West Bank, but also to Israel proper. Now, that that one of the ways Land for All thinks about that, right, is through a notion of those Palestinian refugees remaining, being citizens of a Palestinian state based in the West Bank and Gaza, even as they live in Israel proper, right? So you, uh, and while Israeli settlers stay in the West Bank um, and retain their Israeli citizenship, even though they're living, so, so, so this is where a confederation model model could work. Um, uh, but I do think that, um, I think that our, uh, the, the way that the two-state solution has been conceived by some people, which is essentially to say virtually no right of Palestinian refugee return to, within inside, inside Israel proper, I think ultimately I, I've come to the view that I think that, that would be unlikely to, um, to be a, that effective of a solution. Um, uh, and I also think that we have to really have a conversation about the moral, the, about the morality of telling, you know, we are a, a, a people who for 2000 years have prayed, you know, every morning, certainly prayed every morning since the creation of kind of modern liturgy, right, for a return to this land. By, how do we tell people who, who grew up in a, in, in, a, in a place that they don't have the right to return to that place? Um, so I, I I think that one of the reasons that I would favor a confederation model over a traditional two-state model, if I had to choose between the two at this point, is that I think it creates more opportunity for, 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 for meeting people's leg legitimate rights to have the option of returning. That does not mean going to someone's house and kicking them out of their home. And I don't think that's the way most Palestinians that I know think about it, but it means having it means it means maybe compensation, and it means having the right to return to the to the city where you were born. I mean, you know, again, one of the things that I think comes across to any person who spends time with Palestinian writing and with and with and, and learns from the Palestinian experience is the enormous power of the importance for people of being able to go to play, go back to places that were precious to them. Um, and one of the things that I find appealing about the confederation model, even if one doesn't go fully towards the one state model, is it provides some way of realizing that. And I am, I'm saddened that in our Jewish discourse, 
that we are people who take so much pride in our ability to remember, to not forget, and to hold sacred memory, um, um, and to try to fulfill it, are often so dismissive of that when it comes to Palestinians. It's a, I mean, I think that's a very powerful point. And, you know, one of the things that is, is so challenging in this is, you know, we've been praying for our return to this land for 2000 years. And, you know, we've got 70, 70 plus now there. And I think for many, many, many people, um, the concept of altering that long sought and hard fought reality uh, is, is terrifying, frankly. And the idea that they would need to uh, willingly give up, I'm actually not gonna call it privilege now, but uh, power, the literal power of the state, the literal power of the military. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we didn't get into this and I don't know that we have time. You know, there are a lot of people in, I, I think in Israel and in the Jewish community here um, that have that frame of Israel as the refuge. I mean, Israel, particularly as a post-Holocaust refuge, but looking further back historically also. Um, and that that's a, that, that's a very difficult, uh, you know, point for a lot of people. Yes, I'd, lo I'd love to respond to it. If you, if sure. I, mean, I want I just to say a couple of things. First of all, I, I think that to say that Jews um, lose some power and certainly lose a fair amount of privilege is, is far from saying that Jews then become powerless. Um, and that, that's one of the things that I tried to say in my, in my piece. I mean, that, that, that Jews, I think, would remain, retain enormous power. Um, uh, partly, they, even if they dip below 50% of the population, they would be, for instance, a much, much larger percentage than the white South African population. And also, they would have enormous economic power. And we know from our own country and South Africa and many other places that economic power translates into political power for better or for worse, right? In some ways, for many ways for worse. Plus Jews would have a very powerful diaspora. So I, I think that the, to me, the notion that Jews would not be able to defend our vital interests is, is a Holocaust template that doesn't really bear much it, a bit, kind of examination on the ground. I would say on the question of refuge, I think given the power that Jews retain, it is entirely really realistic to believe that Israel could remain a refuge for Jews in distress, which is what it needs to be. Does, would Israel necessarily remain a country that has no immigration system for non-Jews and where you or I, you know, where I can go and get citizenship on day one? Perhaps not, but I don't think that's vital. And the last thing I would say, I think it, I didn't get into this piece, but I think it's important for us to talk about. If we're thinking about Israel as exists now, as one of its functions is to protect the welfare of Jews, global Jewry, it's not doing a good job, right? I mean, one of the things we have to factor into the equation is that Israel, the Israeli government is complicit with some of the leaders and forces in the world that are most fanning anti-Semitism, right? So I'm not saying that that, that means that, you know, one, that an Israel-Palestine is without any problems, goodness knows. But I just think it's important for us to remember when we think about the relationship, that the relationship is in many ways quite problematic now in terms of the role that Israel is playing playing in terms of fighting global anti-Semitism because of the alliance that the Israeli government has made with a number of regimes that are in some ways really threatening their own diaspora populations. You know, Orban in Hungary, for instance, and Donald Trump, arguably. I would say inarguably. Okay, inarguably. <laughs> Ori, did you wanna? I uh, just wanted to, to sharpen uh, the, the question that, we, uh, that was asked earlier. And that is something that I've, I've seen quite a few of the critics uh, uh, make that point is why should, or why do you not, not why should, why do you think that Israelis would ever give up any of the power? Um, they love their state, they love their country, they love their system, they, are, uh, they feel strong and, and secure there. Why would they ever uh, want to make any kind of, uh, of a concession on that? So first of all, I think it's important to remember we're talking here about Israeli Jews, right? Um, uh, a 20 percent of the population uh, are Palestinian citizens of Israel who would have a very different perspective, right? Um, and who, so by think, the way, are, are more supportive of a two-state solution than Israeli Jews are, but never mind. We'll, we'll complicated, right? Because they also don't want Israel to be a Jewish state, mostly, right? Um, so they they have a vision, essentially, what their preference is of a, is a Palestinian state next to a, a state for all its citizens, right? Um, not a Palestinian state next to a Jewish state. 
Um, uh, anyway, that's a, um, I mean, you know this very well, Ori. I'm not suggesting I'm telling you anything you don't know. Um, um, the, 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 you're absolutely right, but, 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 but you know, as, as Frederick Douglass famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand, right? It, it would not be logical to, as I say, Israeli Jews have expressed their revealed preference, which is for the status quo, a status quo that, that leaves millions of Palestinians without basic rights. Um, that uh, I think that Israeli Jews will reconsider to the degree that they see that the costs of controlling millions of people who lack basic rights are going up. For the last 15 years, the costs have been relatively low. What I pray and what I hope that some of my writing might in a very small way contribute to is an is a moral challenge, not a violent challenge, not a challenge that costs Israeli lives, but a moral challenge that leads the costs to go up so the Israeli Jews face a different political calculation. That's one of the reasons I've argued for conditioning military aid, for instance. Uh, and I fear that if we don't help to create, Palestinians help to create that, because Palestinians will lead it, but if we don't help them to create that, we may find that the costs go up in some very different and much uglier and more painful ways, which looks like, you know, I mean, look at what happened in South Africa, basically. In the 19, there had been wave after wave of uprising. And then starting in the 18, 1980s, there was a quote unquote intifada, an uprising, which never ended, right? So I think people have to think about what, what a third intifada which without end looks like, right? When they think about where the status quo may be leading us. Okay. Um, so we, we have five minutes left and we do want to bring into the, into the conversation uh, Jim Klutznik, the chair of our board. I am afraid that we may not be able to uh, um, ha see him because we have a problem with, uh, with video. But Jim, if you can hear us, uh, yes, the floor is yours. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Peter for uh, quickly agreeing to uh, work with us on bringing you to, uh, to the public on this in, a, in, a, uh, in our own way. Uh, and, um, and I want to, uh, it, it's been, uh, I'm sure all who've been on this, and there are quite a few people who've been on this, uh, have, uh, have learned, because I, I consider you a rabbi in some sense, uh, for a lot of us, I think, who are on here, uh, and certainly the questions you've posed uh, make people think. I want to be a little more practical as, as we close here, uh, and, and, and I uh, would love to sit at lunch as we typically have done in the past, Peter, and debate these questions with you, uh, but I'm not gonna do it in public. And, uh, and, and you know where we stand on this. We're still very much a, a two states people because uh, to us, the uh, near-term history and the demography and the geography of what's transpired in, in uh, the last 80 to 100 years uh, still dictates to us that uh, two sovereign states are uh, not only practical, but uh, bring justice to both peoples. And one people now has justice, the other is living in an apartheid state on a de facto uh, basis as, as you guys have been discussing. Uh, because uh, uh, annexation is, uh, is just a, a Band-Aid for occupation, which, which is in fact uh, there are the differences of annexation to us leads to something which I think is really the ultimate uh, uh, goal of this Israeli government and most Israeli governments recently, which is two realistic states. One, the greater Israel, which includes Judea and Samaria, which is very important to the most powerful interest groups in Israel uh, from, from a biblical point of view. And uh, the other is, is Jordan which will be the Palestinian state. That's what I think they're looking at. And from a practical point of view, whether it's one state or two states uh, in the version we have now in a de facto way, or what, uh, uh, what we don't want is to see what Netanyahu thinks is a practical state. And we've had a president of the United States who stumbled into this by accident, he and his minions, uh, because he finds that even in this, his deal of the century, uh, there are plenty of Israelis, particularly in the West Bank, who are not in favor of that because they don't want to see a Palestinian state 
anywhere in the confines of Israel. Uh, so maybe ultimately when it's all sorted out, there may be a confederation, there may be a binational state, but to get there, if that's what it's gonna be, uh, Peter, I, I think uh, the, the, uh, the way to get there is through two to sovereign states and sovereign states are the coin of the realm in the world today. That's how nations and people identify themselves in a practical sense. Uh, particularly since the fall of colonialism. So what I, what I would like to say to all of us, we do have a common cause, whether it's Peter's version of it, whether it's what we are thinking about or any, but any place in between. Uh, we have been silenced, we've been intimidated uh, by individuals and organizations here and in Israel uh, and many times in collaboration to prevent most of us who are on this call from doing what we want to get to one way or the other, which is justice for both peoples. And uh, I want us all to stand up to that now. We can't allow that to intimidate us anymore. And we have to push for, the, for justice in either form that we've been talking about in any form we're talking about today. And I thank everybody who's joined in here. I thank Peter, I thank Hadar, already coming in at the last minute as well. Uh, for helping guide us through what I consider to be an initial step for all of us. We should be doing this again and again and again and let those who want to intimidate us understand that we will not be stopped at this point. This has got to change now. And whatever has been discussed about today, all of it is good. It's just a matter of how we configure it ultimately. And we have to stop, the, and we have to stop being intimidated by others. And that's, that's what I want to leave us with today. So thank you, Peter, and look forward to seeing you again, you both, both this way and in person. Likewise, Jim. Thank, Likewise. thank you, Dar. Thanks, Ori. Thank, thank you, Jim. And I too will extend my thanks to you, Peter, for, um, for joining us today, but far beyond that, really, for your, your partnership, for your leadership. Um, you know, I have no doubt that we are uh, in this together uh, in terms of building this movement for peace and equality and justice. And we all, have, we all have lots of work to do. So thank you to the many, many people who joined us today. Um, this will be available as a recording on our website shortly. Um, and we will, we will share it out there. Um, and we look forward to being in touch with all of you soon. So with that, I say thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.